Well, for those of you on the East Coast, like me, good evening. Uh, for those of you on the West Coast, good afternoon. And for those of you in between, good, good day. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm your host tonight for EdChat Interactive. Uh, let me also just mention that we have some really interesting events coming up. We'll continue the Corwin series on February 15th with Jim Knight. We'll be talking about how to have better conversations. And then on February 10th, we actually have two different sessions, one with Steve Piha, which will be discuss discussing high leverage strategies for teaching writing. And then Russ Qualia will continue his monthly series on school voice. He talks, he, he leads discussions on school voice, teacher voice, and student voice, uh, which are always very interesting. He's a, he's a very dynamic individual. But not any more Goldberg who's a teacher, consultant, and tri-athlete. So let me pull down the slides and let me pull up Gravity. Gravity, how are you? Hi. You're up. Hi. So, um, so you're not home. You're in California. I am. As someone who lives in New York, I am stranded by the snow, and so I'm in San Diego. I know that's not a terrible place to be stranded, but I'm actually talking to everyone from my hotel room. So bear with me with uh, how that's going. And you that means uh, somebody else in your driveway? Or your walk? Yes, I missed all of the snow. And I'm actually snow or, or, I'm a little disappointed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, we got out and we had a chance. To, we live uh, across the street from a golf course, so we got a chance to cross-country ski. But anyhow, you have so much to cover that I don't want to take up time here. Um, why don't I pull myself down and get your slides up? Great. Okay? Yeah. Excellent. So um, I'm really excited today to talk about um, some of the ideas in my new book, Mindsets and Moves to Inspire Independent Reading, as the topic of our conversation today. Uh, and I'm going to basically take you through some of the theory in the beginning, but in a very practical way, and then some concrete strategies that you can take away to help your students become the kind of readers who have ownership, who truly are independent, and who actually enjoy and choose to read. So you can go to that next slide. So if you are on Twitter, I put my Twitter handle here and also a hashtag that we've been using for other um, social media events too. So feel free to tweet at me. I'm not gonna be checking while we're on the conversation, but I'd love to be able to tweet back at you afterwards. Next slide. So um, I did get a chance to look at the list of who's attending and I do know some of you, but there's a lot I don't. So I'll just take a minute to introduce myself a little bit. So um, I'm a teacher, so I've taught special education, general education, reading, and one year as a science teacher. Um, I've worked actually pre-K pre through 12 and as a college professor. Um, lately, I've been really working mostly as a consultant. Um, I've partnered with a a team of folks and we work in 30 different school districts trying to really help build the kind of independence we're going to talk about today and most of the examples i'm going to be showing are from classrooms that i'm in on an almost daily basis um, in the tri-state area and also i'm an author now, some of you might know my work um, from my first book conferring with readers that i co-wrote with jen saravalo and the new books out mindsets and moves that just came out in october right, next slide I want to start with a comic strip. I'm wondering if anyone can relate to this. So I'll just read it to you, even though I know you can read it to yourselves too. So, what do you mean I'm not independent enough? Show me how to be independent. I can't be independent without your help. Insert any one of your students' voices, where those students are kindergarten or in 12th grade or anywhere in between. So I'm sure some of you are smiling and nodding as you see this, because I think a lot of us can relate to this sort of sentiment being uh, presented by our students. And so in some ways, this is what I'm gonna be talking about today, summed up by this funny little cartoon. Next slide. So based on the work I did in many, many classrooms across the grade levels, um, different iterations of the same kind of question keep coming up. And this is the question that we're really gonna be pursuing today too, which is, how can we help students become deep thinking, hardworking, 
self-directed and truly independent readers. And by truly independent readers, what I mean is when no one is telling them what to do. And so that's really the question we're gonna pursue today is what are some things we can actually do so that students aren't waiting for the, what are we supposed to read? How long do I have to read? What do I need to write about? Does this count? How many minutes? Are you making it right? All of the sort of questions that show that they're doing it for us and not because of that sort of internal drive and motivation. So let's get started with what we can actually do and what I found when I tried to answer this question. So I'm gonna talk about a few different shifts that we can make. And the first one is really a shift from focusing on the teacher to the students. And I wanna tell a short little story of sort of how this one hit me. So um, like many of you, whether you are teachers, which there are a lot on this call, or administrators, which there are also a lot on this call, I sort of was noticing that when I go into classrooms, whether I'm in, going in classrooms with other teachers because we're modeling lessons, or looking at a demonstration class, or whether it's a bunch of literacy coaches or principals and I going in to see what's going on in classrooms, that the focus tends to be on the teacher. That's probably not shocking to any of us. But I was actually spending some time um, at a Red Bulls game, which is a professional soccer team over by me. And during the game, I had this sort of aha moment, which was during the whole game, I realized I never once looked at the sideline at the coach. I actually don't know who the coach is and I had season tickets to the Red Bulls. Like you don't go to a soccer game to look at the coach on the sideline, you go to look at the players on the field. And when I realized that I thought often when we're looking at the teacher, yes, the teacher has an important role just like the coach of that Red Bull soccer team does. But if all of our attention or even most of our attention is on the teacher or on that sideline coach, we're kind of missing what really matters. And so just like you don't pay you know, hundreds of dollars to go to a professional sporting event sometimes, to look at the coach, you watch the players, I'm suggesting we do the same thing when we go into classrooms and we start to really put the focus on the students and the teacher we look at when we think about what's a shift that maybe needs to happen. So in the next slide, I really show you some of the work that I did um, that's highlighted in some of the pages of Mindsets and Moves is sort of how we looked for in classrooms by simply looking for different things that really changed what we found. So um, if you look at the slide on the left, this reading workshop checklist was sort of a shortened version of what I saw in the you know, dozens and dozens of classrooms I worked in. And in some ways I was perpetuating this because my checklist sort of looked like this too. And if you look at this list, you notice it all starts with the teacher, the teacher, the teacher, the teacher. And when we focus on the structures that teachers put in place, that can be helpful, but it's so limiting because we're not putting the focus on what are actually the students doing. So if you look at the one on the, the right hand side, I noticed that when I started to go into classrooms with teachers and coaches and we started to focus on what are the students doing? Yes, that meant sometimes looking at what we were doing as teachers, but it really shifted the focus to who mattered most. And if we want independence, but we're looking at the teacher, we're looking in the wrong place. So for those of you, and I, some people already put this on there, um, RSVP to this chat, those of you who have the book, you'll notice in Appendix A, there's the student-focused reading checklist. And a lot of folks have been saying how much this has changed and given them so much different kind of nuanced information about where to go next with independence by really putting the focus on the teacher. I'm sorry, not on the teacher, student. Next slide. A second shift that I, I found actually came from reading about positive psychology. So I read a book called The Happiness Advantage, and I also um, watched his TED Talk um, by someone named Sean Acker. Highly, highly recommend the TED Talk if you don't have time to read his book. He's engaging, he's somewhat handsome to be honest, he's funny, and really, really smart. And so I wanna tell again another short story that helped me to really look at this idea of independence and ownership. Um, that really came from positive psychology in one of his stories about the business world. The actor has gotten lots of money and lots of grants and traveled around the world with his premise and his research findings that are not actually that shocking. What he found was that the happier you are, the more successful you are. I'm going to repeat that because it's so obvious that it's worth saying again. What he found is that the happier you are, the more successful you are. And as a result of that, he basically got hired by lots of different companies to not just increase productivity, but to help create an environment where people were happier 
because when people are happier at their jobs, they do better and they're more successful. One of the companies he was working at, he tells a story about, which was um, down in Wall Street. And there was a group of men who kind of were, he was working with, and one of them came to him one day and said, um, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, you know, Mr. Acker, Dr. Acker, I need to talk to you. Things are not going so well. And the thing about Sean Acker is he's not the kind of lay on your couch psychologist. He's a positive psychologist. So he didn't ask him to lay that down, but he did say, say what's going on. And he went on to tell him that. He was noticing his wife had been making several errors at home. And he was quite fed up with all the errors she was making. So his strategy was to make a spreadsheet. For two weeks, he had tracked every error his wife had made and then added a column for suggestions, adding his own suggestions when he had them and leaving it blank to see if she had one. And his plan was to present this to his wife that Friday evening. Some of you are probably gasping as I did when I read that. The thing that struck me was how he decided to sort of advise him. I mean, obviously he said, do not give that spreadsheet to your wife and probably save the man from getting a divorce. But he took it a step further and said, tell me what you do exactly in this company. What's your job? So he said, come follow me and I'll show you. And what the man did was his job was to find errors in the tax forms of the company. So all day long he was looking for error, error, error. So it's no wonder when he went home, that's all he saw with his wife. And this is actually one of those um, sort of phenomenon or theories that psychologists have found is that when you do one thing all day long, you can't actually turn it off. What that really made me think about a lot about was being a teacher and how easy it is to look for what kids can to do and the errors that they make. As a result of this, this one man in Hawaii, he actually was quite depressed. He wasn't at home he wasn't happy in his job and he was you know almost at the point where he needed to quit but of course he couldn't he needed to put food on the table for his family so sean acker did something i thought was so simple and brilliant he said to him you don't need to quit your job you need to change the way you do your job instead of looking for errors you can start to look for what is actually accurate and correct and as a result of looking for what's already correct you'll still find the errors by default or when given a suggestion, doesn't get defensive, but says, thank you, I'm gonna try that. They're the kind you might recognize. In some cases, a lot of you wrote in that you have kids who are significantly behind with your reading levels, where they're not pie in the sky pretending that they're not, they can acknowledge the area to work on, but they don't get defeated by them. On the other hand, when someone has a fixed mindset, they tend to believe that their intelligence or their ability is static, it's pretty much fixed, and no matter how hard they work, they're not going to get too much better. Therefore, when they start to struggle, they see it as a negative. It's kind of pointless. If I'm already good at something and I struggle, I'm going to have to hide that because that would mean I might be getting worse. Or if I'm already feeling like I'm not so good at something and I struggle, what's the point of putting the work in? Because I'm not going to get any better anyway. And so those with a fixed mindset then tend to avoid things that are challenging for them. Think again of an example of somebody with a fixed mindset, especially as a reader, I notice those are the types of students who, in a conference when given feedback, kind of shrug it off or get defensive or make excuses. Um, when you ask kids what they're working on, they have nothing they're working on. Um, there's a lot of avoidance kind of behaviors. And I'm guessing a lot of you signed up for this because you have students with fixed mindsets. Now, I want to go over a couple of things, though, so we don't just get defeated and think, okay, well, they have fixed mindsets, now what? Um, a couple of things that there's some misconceptions about out there, I noticed. One is that mindsets themselves are not fixed. So whether you have a growth or a fixed mindset in an area, you can absolutely change it. So as educators, that's really empowering and gives me hope that if a student walks in your door on the first day or even the 20th or 50th day of school with a fixed mindset, it's not over. There are absolutely things we can do to help shift that that we're going to talk about tonight. The other misconception I see is that it's not all or nothing. So I've seen students who as nonfiction readers have a growth mindset, as fiction readers have a fixed mindset. Or today, on this given day, they seem to be having a fixed mindset and tomorrow a growth mindset. You know, it's not all or nothing. And so we sort of don't want to rise off as, as having something and just saying this is the way they are, but looking for the opportunities to see today in this moment. What's the mindset and how can I help to shift it if that needs to happen? 
Next slide. So if we know that we, when students have growth mindsets, they actually achieve more, and there's lots and lots of research now about how much more students achieve when they have a growth mindset, then that means we have to help them shift their relationship to struggle. And when they do that, they begin to develop grit. So grit's gotten some bad press recently, but the kind of grit I'm talking about here is the kind that goes along with a growth mindset, meaning you're willing to put the work in to reach those short and long-term goals because you see it's going to pay off. And don't we want students in all areas, but certainly as readers, to recognize they're going to hit challenges, there'll be bumps in the road, some days the text is hard, the questions are hard, they don't feel like it. But when they put the work in and they apply the strategies we've been teaching, that they absolutely will see those results. That's the kind of gritty reader that I'd like to see in every classroom, and I'm sure you do too. So some of the research I actually read about this to understand this more besides Duckworth's research on grit was I looked into neuroscience. Now, I am not a neuroscientist. <laughs> so, you know, I read the books and I got translators and I tried to figure out what's going on. And I'm going to explain one simple but powerful piece that I think we all need to understand about the way the brain works and how this ties to, to struggle and grit. So um, I read a book called Quiet Leadership by David Rock years ago and then looked at some of the, the further research. And what they found was that when somebody encounters a problem or a struggle that they need to solve, what's happening in the brain is one part has to connect to another part and a synapse is formed. And when that synapse is formed, when the problem is solved or the challenge is tackled, endorphins are actually released into the body. Dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline are released, and you get that aha feeling for the actual learner's high. And what's interesting about this is when somebody steps in and solves a problem for somebody else, that doesn't happen. Not only is the connection not made, but those chemicals are not released throughout the body. And as a result of that, people learn to be passive and dependent because they're not getting, not necessarily, they're not getting the problem solved themselves, but they're also not getting that learner's high. They're not getting those chemicals like dopamine, adrenaline, and serotonin flowing through the body. And the reason why we have those chemicals is because it's the way we've evolved as human beings so that we are the kind of people who will survive, that humans survive on the planet, and will want to solve problems again in the future. It's like the cherry on top. It's the reward we get physiologically in our bodies for all the struggle we put in. But in some ways, struggle has gotten a bad rap. When kids struggle, we tend to step in. Sometimes we step in right at that sort of turning point where if we just stepped back for one more moment, they would do the work and get the synapse formation and get those chemicals. So the biggest thing I've been saying to teachers recently, myself, to be honest, because this is so hard, is when the struggle starts to happen, not to step in and solve it, but to actually take a step back Take a breath and ask yourself, are you stepping in so that you get the learner's high from solving the problem from the student? Is it for you because you're uncomfortable with the struggle or is it for the student? And oftentimes in that moment of asking the question, it slows me down enough to get clear, but it also gives the student a moment to see if they can solve it themselves. And if they can't, we can always step back in and help them. But if we step in too soon and we help them before they've gone the process, we sort of robbed them of that moment. And another thing I kind of think about, and I don't know that this was in the book, this is not the scientific part, this is me interpreting it, is I wonder in some ways as teachers, if we're so exhausted by the end of the day, because we're trying to solve 30 people or 100 people's problems every day, we're getting that learners high ourselves from solving the problem, and then we're crashing. It's like we get dopamine, rushes if yes, 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 I solved this problem, and then we come back down. And that up and down, I think, for a lot of us leaves us completely depleted. So it's not just important for our students, it's important for us to step, take some steps back and let the struggle happen. That's where the grit develops, and that's also where the learner's high develops that's gonna help them wanna solve problems again in the future. All right, we're gonna do one more slide and then you'll have an opportunity to process this. So a lot of you might have read David, um, Dan Pink's book, Drive, or seen his TED Talk. And he talked about a study in there that was fascinating to me. So I went back to the 1970s research and read it. 
And I want to tell you a little bit about what I learned that connects to this idea about independence. So there were some psychologists in the 70s, so this information has been going on for a long time, wanted to find out what motivates students. And one of the famous studies was they went to a preschool, and it was one of these research preschools that has two-way mirrors so that um, people can study the class by looking out at the mirror, but the students don't know they're being observed. And they observed for two weeks and watched the students during the choice time of the day. So there were different choices. If you're not familiar with early childhood, the, the choices could be like an art center or a block center or um, maybe something with manipulatives that they were building. Um, maybe something with the teacher. And they wanted to see at first, during those first two weeks, what was the most popular choice that was made. And far and away, it was the art center. So then what they did was they met with the teachers in the classroom, and they also talked to and focus groups several other preschool teachers and said, what would be something that preschoolers see as a reward that they would want to work toward? And what they came to consensus around was giving kids a certificate, like a participation, colorful stickers on it, they would love that. Like, if you're four years old, that's amazing. So what they had the teachers do then for the next two weeks is say to the students, over the next two weeks, anybody who chose to participate in the art center would get a reward now, this certificate with a stick color on it. And then they watched and they did the same thing they did in the first two weeks when there was no extrinsic reward. And what common sense would tell us and common school practices would tell us was that the numbers of kids who chose then the art center would go up. But actually what happened is after the end of those two weeks, they couldn't get anybody to choose or go into the art center anymore. It was the least popular. Now this puzzled them, it really puzzled them. And that kind of study has been done over and over and over again. And the finding was, or the interpretation from this, these studies like this are, at first the art center was viewed as play. I mean, the play is not just that it was actually play in the way that we're playing games, but play is defined as the motivation is coming from something intrinsic and the reward is the activity itself. Like getting to participate is the reward. But when you put an extrinsic reward on it, something like a certificate, then it turns it into work. So the art center, which was playful, became work because when you put something external on it, you're no longer doing it for the value in and of itself. You're doing it because you're going to get something external for it. And when I read this, and then I read the study again because I didn't want to hear this, and I read others like it, what I realized was how often we're doing reading in our classrooms. We're well-intentioned. We mean well. Our district might have even spent money to purchase a program like this. But when we put any kind of external reward on reading, we're automatically framing it more as work than play. We're saying that the value of the experience of reading is devalued. And what's more important is getting the points in the program or the pizza certificate or the sticker or the extra recess, whatever that reward is. And so a lot of us might want to look carefully at if we're putting extrinsic rewards around reading, are we robbing of the reward itself of the experience? Because as an adult myself, I don't get a reward that's external for reading, I'm sure none of you do. I get to fall in love with a character or travel to a new place. or get the burning questions that I'm pursuing answered in my research and reading about it. And if we can start to share that with kids and make that be the reward, then we're a lot more likely that they're gonna see reading as a playful experience that they're gonna to choose to do in their lives beyond when they're told to. Next slide. So here's the discussion part. So I've been talking for a while, and that was sort of the end of the theory part. But the whole second half is going to be about, so what do we do with this? But I wanted to share with you some of that theory from psychology, from neuroscience, because I think as educators, it's important to understand some of the things that like, nothing I shared there was probably so earth shattering, but it's more in our gut intuition. And so that's some of the research to back it up. And so I'm just going to name some of those shifts I talk about and ask you to take a moment in those groups that you are in, whether you're chatting with IM or in the face-to-face -face video to, to talk about this with one another. But I talked about shifting the attention from the teacher to the students. I also discussed shifting our um, relationship to struggle from mindset to growth mindset and from framing reading for our students as play instead of work. 
So think a little bit about which of those that I talked about did you connect with most? And I know you're in all different roles. Some of you are um, administrators, some of you are educators, some of you are teachers. And then maybe which ones are you ex excited to explore more of and take on in your classroom? So this is the time to share to break into small groups. So as Gravity mentioned, uh, if you have video, you can, uh, click on the icon or the avatar of another person in your room and share with them, uh, discuss with them. So what shifts did you each connect with most? Uh, which ones are you excited to explore more? If you don't have video, but you, you can still get to interact with others by typing in answers to these questions into your IM box and you can respond to other people who are responding who are entering information to the IM box as well. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to come down for about a minute. We'll give you about a minute to discuss and then we'll bring uh, gravity back up and it's also. So for the next couple minutes uh, click on the icon of somebody with each other in, in the IM box. You know, I had a I had a question for you because you, when you were talking about um, the the mindset, the fixed mm -hmm. and one of the things that, that dawned on me is that very often we don't just have fixed mindsets about ourselves, but we have fixed mindsets about students. Like we may have it in our head that so and so is not capable of reading at this grade level, and and that may affect the way we deal with that student or that that. Uh, we may believe that so-and-so is, is an advanced student, so it has to work. Um, can you, is, is, that, is that the case also? Yes, I think that um, all of us, and I'll put myself in there too, um, have had moments of having fixed mindsets with certain students. And I think a lot of that connects to that work that um, Dr. Sean Acker talked about with sort of what we look for with students. So I think sometimes when we read a file or we read an IEP or we know like the, the notorious student for whatever reason, it can be easy to see that student through the lens of a fixed mm -hmm. mindset or looking at what they can't do. And I think really mm -hmm. the only way to shift that is to just acknowledge that that's what's happening and to realize that if we start to look for what they can do, we can build from there. Um, but mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point. And again, it's not always, but there might be a day where a student just is frustrating to us, where people too write and say, how can we be aware of our own mindsets, not just with ourselves, but also with, with others? Absolutely. OK. All right. Well, thank you. So do you want me to bring up your slides again? Sure, sure. So um, after doing all this research um, and looking sort of into other fields, uh, I began to look at and notice, like, what is it, what are the roles that we take on as teachers and our attempts to promote ownership and independence? Or even if we're not consciously saying today, I want to promote independence or ownership, what do I notice? And some literacy coaches some teachers and I who opened up their classrooms, we, we went in and we really paid attention to this. And the three most common roles that I saw was that teachers took on the role of being an assigner. And what I mean by that is telling kids how much to read, read what to write about their reading. Also the role of being a monitor. And the monitor is going around, and often as teachers, this is when we feel like you know a chicken with their head cut off, just going from student to student to make sure everyone's doing the right thing. And then the third role is being a manager. And by manager, I mean sort of solving the problems and managing the physical space and books and time for every single student. And at the end of the day, when we're the assigner, the monitor, and the manager, and I understand why we often take on those roles, there's not a lot of room for actual independence or ownership. So on the next slide, what I'll show you is sort of what we realized were sort of the repercussions of these three roles we often took on and what they could be instead. So if you look at this um, image, and this is from um, page 27 of Mindsets and Moves, if any of you are following along with the book. If you look at the left-hand side, what we noticed when there was more compliance as the goal in the classroom, the teacher was the one who was doing the assigning, monitoring, and managing. And you see that student box is pretty much empty, that's half of it, because really the only thing they could do was comply or choose not to. They're going to complete the assignment, teacher's going to monitor it, and manage the, all the decisions for them. Then in the middle, we have sort of 
negotiation of it where it's sort of in the middle where maybe sometimes students, sometimes teacher, sort of the conversation back and forth. And if we look all the way on the right hand side when there's ownership, students actually assign themselves their reading. They decide what to read, how much to read, what to think about, which strategies to use that you've already taught them and apply. The students self monitor. When you ask them the question, what are you working on and how is it going and what do you need support with, they have answers because they've been self-monitoring. And then the students self-manage. They make decisions. They're in charge. And when we looked at that right-hand side, a lot of teachers, I get there sometimes, maybe at the end of a unit of study or at the end of the year, or um, when I taught older grades, they got there. I heard a lot of versions of that, and I get all of that. But then I asked them to look hard and myself to look hard at the teacher half of that ownership box. And I think that's actually what part of the challenge is. It's empty. A lot of us didn't know, like, well, what do we do if our students are assigning, monitoring, and managing? If they take that on, then, like, are we just going to, like, sit on Pinterest or be on our computers? Of course not. Um, but I think in some ways that was a gap of sort of we were taught in our teacher ed programs or in previous PD to assign, monitor, and manage. And so it really opened up a place for us to say, well then, like, what do we want it to be? And that could be exciting. Like, what do we want our roles to be if we want students over time to take on more of those three roles? And just because I know we have kindergarten all the way through college professors in this webinar, I wanna say, it's not as if it's one or the other, like you're compliant or you have ownership. But I think of this as a continuum, which is why I have these three as examples, which is, you know, in a kindergarten classroom, it might be by the end of the year, we're looking more to be on the right hand side. In a seventh grade classroom or in a 10th grade classroom, we might look that in every bit of study, we're going to move from the left to the right. And so really, it's a place where you could do a little self assessment with yourself and even with your students to think about at any point in time in the year, sort of where are you and where are your students on this continuum? But what I want to get into for the rest of this webinar is how did we fill that gap? We have that big open teacher spot. Like, what is it that we can be doing then so that we have an important role or set of roles to take on while our students are learning to assign, monitor, and manage? Next slide. So here are a few examples from classrooms from just a few weeks ago that I was working in. So if you look one on the left, you know, this is a student who basically said to her students when we talk about assigning, she said, what are your goals for yourself as we go into this new unit of study? And she said she didn't think they were ready to create goals completely from scratch because it was so new for the students to actually set the goals themselves. So what we did was we came up with these categories of goals, and you can see that's the teacher writing on the chart. And then we modeled and introduced each one, and the teacher really showed them a process and by the way, this is in chapter nine um, of Mindsets and Moves. These lessons are specifically in there. And then the kids went about reflecting about which is their goal and they wrote their name on this post-it. They stuck it next to the goal they were gonna work on. And they had to articulate, these were younger students, so they did it verbally. Older students had done similar work, but in writing, why that goal? And at the end of the period, when the teachers and I stepped out, I said, how, how accurate were these kids' goals? Would you have picked these goals for them? First time doing it, and she said, without a doubt, they were all right on. And so in some ways, it's really just having that trust that when we give kids space to set goals, that they can actually do that. And I said to her, what if one of them wasn't right on? And she said, well, the worst that happens is pick a goal that maybe isn't the top goal I would pick for them. But all of these goals, all of these options are things I want my, all of my kids to be able to, like, there's no wrong choice. So this is one step toward, it's not total autonomy, total ownership, because we're still having a say, but it's one step toward that. And another example of a tool is, is the one on the right, um, different class. Um, this was actually with second graders. So this is not uh, an upper grade example like some of the others, just to give an example here. Where the teachers had taught all these different note-taking strategies or tools, and that's on the left-hand side. And so we made this chart and brought it in. And then in small groups, the teacher met with each um, set of kids in small groups and really wanted them to think about when and why they would choose to use that type of note-taking strategy. And the reason why this was so powerful is if we want students to be the managers of their own time, and that means they're making choices, they need to know the when and the why of a choice. And we realize that oftentimes when we teach strategies to students, 
We teach them the what and the how, but we don't often teach them the why and the when. And we don't know why or when to choose. If we don't know why or when to choose a tool, then we're often not going to, and we're simply going to mimic or copy what the teachers told us to do that day. And so these are two concrete examples, if this is something that you're working on in your classroom. And both of these are directly out of different lesson ideas. There's examples in different grade levels of some tools teachers have been using to work toward that right-hand side of that continuum on ownership. We'll look at one more student example on the next slide. We can move to the next slide. So this is an example of the monitoring. So once students set a goal, they often think about why and they write it down. So here's a student, this was a student in a fifth grade classroom um, who wrote on her post-it, today my goal is to start a character timeline and a positive and negative chart, which is basically making a timeline of the main events in the character's life. And then she came up with this with her partner that they were gonna put a plus or a negative sign based on if they thought that was a positive or negative event that the character was involved in. And she wrote, why? I'm beginning my book, so I want to learn about my character. And so you can see that this is an intention. And this teacher put this in place, one, because it helped kids to do the self-monitoring so that later on in the period or even the next day, when she asked the kids to reflect on, you know, how did your work go today, they have something concrete to go back to. And she gave them just two minutes at the end of the period to turn to a partner and show them what they did put the post-it there and talk about how did that work for them that day. And sometimes the kids said things like, didn't go so well, or I made this choice, but I don't think that's the choice I actually needed to make. And there's learning in that. There's the struggle part of developing the grit. And sometimes kids were energized and said, it's working really, really well, and I'm gonna keep working on that. But the second reason she had it right to write it, she chose to write it, ugh, I'm sorry. The second reason she, asked her students to write it down was a little bit of accountability because I'm imagining there's at least one teacher out there who's saying this is all well and good but how do I know who's doing what and how do I hold them accountable there's some personal accountability in this example because the student chose it and wrote it down but this could be on a chart that's hung up around the room there's some examples of that in the book this could be in a reading notebook this could be given to the teacher at the end of the period with a reflection on how it went so there's still some of that accountability that we can get as educators too. So those are just a few examples of some of the tools, but these small little things done over time and modeled for kids can have a huge difference in that ownership. Next slide. So I think we're gonna skip over this discussion, but instead I'll just pause to say, Here's something you might think about at the end of the session, which is um, of those roles, the, the manager, the monitor, the assigner, um, is that, are some of those roles ones that you sort of notice in yourself that you tend to take on? Or if you're an administrator there, you notice that the teachers in your building take on? And maybe even starting to think about what does compliance look like or what does ownership look like in the classrooms that you work in? It certainly looks very different in a first grade classroom than an 11th grade classroom. And so I'll invite you to Sort of think about those at the end of the session and take that back into your room when you go back tomorrow. Let's move on to the next slide so I can give you a little more strategy idea. So if we want to give up our main roles as being assigners, monitors, managers, and we have that empty box, here are the four roles that I suggest we take on. I call them the four M's so we can easily remember them. So the first role is being a minor. And I don't mean, notice I'm spelling it E-R, not O-R, because that came up once or twice with folks, not an underage person, but a minor, like somebody who's mining and trying to uncover something. So when we're a minor, when we take on that role with students, we're really focusing on assessments, but not a right-wrong assessment, but really trying to uncover what are students doing and thinking as readers? What's their process? That's that admiring piece, like what makes them work? I'm gonna wonder with curiosity about them. And I'll give you some strategies for that in a moment. The second role is being a mirror. And when we're a mirror, the focus is feedback. And we're really reflecting back to students. What do we see and hear them doing? And what are the outcomes or results of that? That's really tied into mindset. And we'll talk about that again in a moment. The third role is being a model. And that focus is demonstration. So that's when a lot of you ask in this webinar about how do we help kids go deeper? 
that's where we take on the spotlight and we show them what we do as readers and we show them that deeper, more rest, close reading work. And then the last role is being a mentor. And that's really the, the focus of guided practice and coaching where we're now you know, saying to them, I just modeled something, I just showed it to you, now you try it out, but we don't leave them to try it out on their own. We're like the coach on the sideline, um, guiding them and helping them through the steps of this new strategy or process. So let's look at a few examples of how to actually do each of these. Next slide. So um, in chapter five, I have a whole chapter dedicated to this with classroom scenarios and step-by-step, -step, what are the five steps you can take on? I'm just gonna give you the overview now and invite you to read a little bit more about that on your own. So the five steps are the first one is to set a purpose. And what do we set a purpose? What I noticed is a lot of teachers when they go into work with a small group or whole group or one-on-one, -on -one, it might be such a large purpose that it's almost like we can't get unco we can't uncover and get underneath what kids are doing. So if our purpose is like, I want to see what's getting in the way of comprehension, I mean, that's huge. A purpose instead, and there's lots of examples in the book, in the book but it might be, I want to figure out, you know, how do they determine what's important and what's not important when they're reading a nonfiction text? So we have to kind of have our curriculum or standards guide what that purpose might be. And the second is to observe the reader. And that I feel like is sometimes overlooked is we're so busy trying to get to every student or get to every group to take 20 seconds to watch them and see what we notice about their process. The third step is to ask process-oriented questions. And I'm gonna show you the list of those on the next slide. And then to actually listen. And I mean, no disrespect by that, but I know at least for me and a lot of my teacher friends, we're so busy asking questions and we're trying to get to every kid, sometimes we forget to actually be present and listen to what they have to say. Or I'm in a district where I have to write down a lot of notes and document everything, so I'm like writing and I'm missing what they say. But see if you can sit back and listen without a lot of judgment and just take in what is it they're sharing with you. And then the last step is to collect, and that's when maybe I would jot some things down and my thinking down. On the next slide, um, I'll show you an example of what some of those questions might be. Yep, we can go to the next slide, thank you. Oh, nope, back one. Thank you. Um, so notice these are pretty open-ended process-based questions. So things like, what are you working on as a reader today? And most teachers say, if I ask that to my kids, they just look at me like I'm talking about, or they just say the title of their book. So you might need to do a lesson where you model for kids how to answer a question like this. You know, that's often a lesson I do early on in the year, but it's not too late to start now to show them when somebody asks you some of these questions, here's what I mean by those questions, and here's how you might answer them. Or can you show me what you're working on to actually get them to go into the text? Or if we look at one of the later ones, what's going well for you as a reader, or what's a challenge for you as a reader? So um, this is from page 96 of the book. There's lots of these questions. But when you ask a question like this, you don't just get the summary retail name of the book. You get them talking about things like this. Even young students say things like, well, I'm trying to figure out what the main idea is, but the headings are just kind of catchy and they don't really give me any clues. So I'm really trying to read and figure that out. And that's hard for me right now. Like, wouldn't we love every student to tell us that clearly what they're working on and what they need help with so we can help them? And I find when we teach them how to ask these questions, and we give them autonomy to make choices, they do start to answer these questions across the grade levels. Next slide. So this is um, being a mirror, the second rule that I'll be talking about. And this is where our language choices have a huge impact on mindset. So my four tips of this are to be specific. So when somebody says to you, Great job when you were, oops. I think you lost me for a minute, so I'll, I'll say that part again. So but when we're not specific, if we say things like great job reading or great job predicting or great job figuring out the theme, kids might go, okay, but they don't really understand what we're talking about. So what we want to do is be specific and actually name the things that we're seeing them doing. Like um, when you got to the conflict scene in the text, you stopped and thought about why conflict happened. That's what I mean by being specific. And we get that information because we've been a minor and we figured out what they're doing. I try to name what is happening, so I'm not focusing on what they're not doing, but what they are doing. 
I make sure it's not something teeny tiny, but something that they can transfer to other reading experiences. And then the last one, and I have to say admittedly the hardest for me, is to take yourself out of it. When you say things like, I like how you, I love how you, it's so great how you, um, but when we put the I like or I love, we're making it about ourselves and we're creating actually dependency again on us. This is the, these are the kids who are so addicted to praise and they need to get the praise that that's why they're gonna be doing these things. But if we want ownership and independence, we want them to see the value even when no one is saying they like it or they love it. So my simple tip is rather than starting with I, start with you or start with the student's name and see if you can take yourself out of it and then tell them by making that choice, how did that impact them? And it's not about if we like it or not, it's how did that help them as a reader? Next slide. So here are a few examples of the kind of compliments we might give that are fixed mindset and growth mindset. And again, you can find um, like this and sentence starters and things on page 123 of Mindsets and Moves. I'm going to go over by a couple minutes. I'm seeing everybody, but I'm hoping people are engaged enough that we can maybe take three or four more minutes to go over the last two roles. Next slide. So the third role is to be a model. And this is really where we get center stage. And a trend I've been noticing in teachers' classrooms when they allow me to come in and coach or co-teach with them is it almost seems like as teachers, we're so ingrained in inquiry or trying to get things from students that I often don't see modeling or we confuse what's modeling with something else. So when I choose to be a model, a choice, it's not a big part of the period, it's usually for just a few moments, not really moments, but minutes. But I'm gonna own it as this is my time to give a clear example and really show students what I do as a reader. It's not a time to elicit their help or to ask them what they would do, but really to take center stage. So when I do that, I first set the context and tell them what to watch for. So I say things like, I'm gonna show you how I, or watch or notice how I, and with older students, I know we have a lot of middle school, high school folks here, I actually might ask them to take a little notes or jot some things down, like give them something to look for, but also with a little bit of accountability to really specifically notice those because they're gonna be asked to talk about them or use them afterward. After I set that context, I show the steps. I don't just tell them, I show them. So I take out my book or my writing about reading and I go through and I demonstrate. I often think of it like a cooking show where in a cooking show, we wouldn't tune in or watch if they just sat there and read you the recipe and told you what to do. We watch because they actually get out the ingredients and make it in front of you. And that's really what I think about when I'm trying to be a model, it's like my own reading show, not a cooking show. And then after doing that modeling, I debrief the what, the how, and the why. I think the more kids hear the what, the how, and the why, the more they can understand after seeing our modeling when they would choose to do that, not just directly after we taught it, but way into the future when they have that choice also. So next slide. So here's um, a self-reflection tool um, from page 146 of the book that a lot of teachers have been using and really noticing that they think they're modeling. I know I do this all the time, but maybe they're actually not. So I'm not gonna read everything to you here, but when you go and, you, and look at the slide on the recording again, or if you look at the book, you'll notice that the left-hand side is really about showing, and the right-hand side is really about telling and asking. And so a lot of teachers or instructional coaches have been using this chart and sort of using this as the place to reflect and give feedback of where to go next when you're acting as a model. Okay, next slide. So the last role we're gonna talk about is being a mentor. And I almost called it being a coach, but three M's and a C is not as memorable as the four M's. But really what I mean by mentoring and coaching is after I've modeled something and I'm ready for the students to try it, whether it's that day or days or weeks later, I wanna be on the sideline really guiding them through the process. So. If I showed them something, now I'm gonna tell them the prompts or give them the nonverbals and really offer that support. And I got a lot of examples and tips for how that could go so that students are more likely to, to take that advice in those prompts and also to not take it over. So uh, an analogy I'll often use is, um, I was a soccer player, kind of have been my whole life, is that I had some coaches who in practice would get on the field with me and they would do so much of the work on the field that we were really good in practice, but when they couldn't be on the field in the games and they had to be on the sideline, we were not nearly as good. And then I had other coaches 
who coached on the sideline no matter what. And when they coached on the sideline, we were the same in practice as we were in games. And I think about the leaders, if we're coaching and mentoring them in their books and we're taking over so much of the work, we might be giving them a false sense of what they can do so that when we do step away, they become less independent because it's just too hard for them. So try to think about the coach as being the sideline coach. We're not in their book. We're next to them giving them prompts, but it's like calling the plays from the sideline. So they're doing the work, but they're where we're there to guide and mentor them. Next slide. So here's an example um, of just the idea of thinking about our most supportive and our least supportive prompts. So also each prompt is not the same. So there's examples in the books of prompts giving a lot of support and then each time taking those gradual releases away. Um, and there's examples of this more in the book too. Next slide. So to wrap it up, some of the shifts that I'm suggesting we make are focusing on the teacher I'm sorry, taking the focus off the teacher, moving to the students. Looking for what is working, not what's not working. Moving from fixed mindset to growth mindset language. Trying to help kids embrace struggle and maybe even ourselves being willing to embrace the struggle. Helping students view reading as play and not work. And moving from those roles you currently have into being a minor, a mirror, a model, and a mentor. This is a lot. So I want to say, if you're looking at this going, holy cow, pick one to work on at a time. A lot of teachers who I've been working with pick one teacher role and say, I'm going to read that chapter. I'm going to look at those slides. I'm going to work on that for a while. And I'm going to have a growth mindset with myself as I make these shifts. Next slide. So as we come to the end here, I'm, I'm asking people to think a little bit like, what are you thinking more about? What are some next steps you might take? Um, and again, if you wanna take just a moment to talk with one another about this or jot this down if you're by yourself and you're not going into those video chats or I am it, because you're giving up a whole hour you gave up um, of your time. And I so appreciate that, to do that for your students in your school. So what are those next steps that you might take so you don't just leave here and forget about it as you go back to snow shoveling or Whatever. So, Mitch, do you want to go into that talking time? Oops. Well, I I was thinking that because uh, we're we've already kept them a little bit longer, uh, that we'd let them um, you know reflect a little bit, but uh, but more mm -hmm. that you know we'd move on and. Um, and kind of summarize, but maybe you know, what are some of the what, what are some of the things that teachers have focused on in the past? Because as you say, this this was a lot of information, and um, you know, I, I you know, as as a teacher, you know, people may have uh, you know may have let all of this and said, well, you know, something. Let let, let me let me tomorrow try one thing thing in the class. What are a couple of things that people have like the next day? Yeah, so I would pick one of those shifts. That's why I sort of framed it as shift. So what is that? So if you've been focusing a lot on the teachers, you might say, mm -hmm. I'm just going to go in and kid watch today. And I'm going to observe and think, you know, how independent are they? What are they coming to the teacher for that they maybe don't need to? Or if it's the mindset piece, you might really, I have some teachers who are going and they're actually um, using their iPhones or iPads to record themselves when they talk to kids. And then mm -hmm. um, playing it back, like, what is the language I'm actually using? Or some teachers, if they do have the book, are reading a chapter and just say, taking it one strategy at a time. So I think picking one shift and saying that's what I'm going to commit to at a time um, is where I would start. And then you can rewatch this to remember the other ones. <laughs> now it's interesting that you bring up the, the mindset again because one of the things that that kind of that that I did actually uh, was I was I for about a week. I focused on being very conscious of where I was giving fixed mindset responses to students and when I was giving growth. When you know, when I said, oh, you did a great job, well, that's really like fixed mindset language. But when I said, this was something, um, you know, 
you showed that you really worked hard on and the results show that was much more of a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so um, a lot of teachers are even making little post-it notes for themselves to walk around with for those examples or a little reminder because we're so used to one kind of um, feedback. So it's nice to really focus on, like you said, consciously to make that decision. Okay. Oh, good. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring myself down and I'll bring back the last slide. Okay. Great. Thank you. So um, if you don't already have the book, um, what I talked about and a lot more specific strategies um, are in there. So if you go to the Core One website, you can get a 20% discount. So I'm hoping that a lot of folks will go buy the book, put it in action, and then tweet at me or email me and let me know how it's going. And my contact information are on the next slide if you want to go to this one, please. So if you're interested in having me come to your school, then the best way to do that would be to go through Core One Professional Learning and the, the phone number's up there and an email is up there. Do a lot of daily workshops, ongoing coaching, and come model a lot of the things in action. So I'd love to, to come into as many classrooms as I can and do that. That's my favorite kind of work. And then if you have specific questions for me that are not necessarily about bringing me to the school, but you just have a follow-up question, because of course I couldn't answer everyone's question today, um, here's my personal email, my Twitter, and my website. Uh, and I really mean that if somebody had a email me and I'll absolutely email you back just give me a few days um, because I am stuck in California uh, and it might take a little bit to get back to you um, I want to really thank everybody for taking this little more than an hour to spend time um, with myself and with your colleagues today um, and I really hope you got at least one tool out of here that you can take back and really help shift the mindsets and develop more independence with your readers well, I, I have to believe people came up with, uh, came out of here with more than one tool that they'll be able to take back into their classes. This was great. Uh, Gravity, thank you so much. Uh, I also want to let everybody know that we will be, we, we did record this and we will be posting the archive um, on the website along with your slides uh, so that, that you'll, you'll have the opportunity to go play what what happened and actually you can share it with your colleagues also uh, you can for the if you have colleagues who weren't able to make it to the to the webinar they can go back and they can review the the video and review the slides so do you have any last last word of wisdom for people before we leave I do actually I think it can be easy to to have fixed mindsets with ourselves as teachers or be hard on ourselves as teachers so I would take uh, Sean Acker's advice, look for what you're all doing well, and also remember it's a process and you can always grow and change with uh, what we're doing. So it's not just for our students, it's for ourselves too. Thank you. Well, oh, great. Okay. Well, Gravity, thank you very much. You. Um, maybe you'll see you on the, on the East Coast at some point. I hope so. And, um, and, and, and maybe, maybe we'll do another one of, in, another EdChat Interactive or, or Corwin series in the fall with you. Great. So um, I'm gonna I'll, I'll pull you down and uh, let you catch a flight or however you're gonna come back here. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, thank you everybody for coming to uh, EdChat Interactive and to our, our Corwin Afternoon uh, Professional Development Series. Um, we'll be resuming this with Jim Knight. Please feel free www edchatinteractive.org if you'd like to register for another session. And until the next session, this is Mitch Weisberg signing off and hope to see you soon. Take care.